Hello everybody, welcome to Lib1000 Online. This presentation is going to talk about recognizing information sources. Today we're going to be looking at the research cycle and specifically how different pieces of information are produced and then disseminated based on the topic that you're looking at. And this will play into what kind of sources you can use, how you can identify them, and which types of sources are good for your academic research. This will reference a lot of the information that we did in the previous module, so keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. When you're thinking about the research cycle, it starts with a person or group of people developing a question that they are hoping to investigate. They develop methods for testing or investigating that question, and they produce results based on those methods. Those results are then analyzed and published in, let's say, a journal, a book, a trade document of some sort. And after that publication is released, it is analyzed by other people within that field and helps those people to develop new questions, and the cycle continues. However, based on the topic that you are interested in that you're looking at, there will be differences within types of research and the methods that will be used to publish and analyze these research questions. Firstly, we want to think about how information is produced and disseminated. So, who creates information? Based on the topic that you're looking at, different people in different fields will create information that pertains to that topic. For example, whether you will usually have meteorologists who are creating information that pertains to weather. For dinosaurs, it would be paleontologists. For social trends, or other more broad topics, you may have many people who are involved. Scientists may be involved, sociologists may be involved, census responders, all help to create information depending on certain social trends. And that's true for a wide variety of topics. The second thing you wanna think about is where that information is going to be available. So a meteorologist who is creating information about weather is going to make that information available through the Weather Channel, through weather apps, or perhaps environmental journals if the information is more um, long-lasting or long-reaching instead of what is the weather today. If you're looking at information about dinosaurs, paleontologists would be developing or creating or discovering that information, and it will be available in museums, in journals, in books, perhaps documentaries, or children's programming. All of that are very valid ways of disseminating information based on the topic. Coming back to social trends, you may find information about this topic within statistical reports. The Pew Research Center releases a lot of statistical reports about different social trends. You could also find it within different journals and conferences. So knowing how this information is uh, presented to the public helps you decide what type of source you can use. And information is everywhere, but it is not all the same level of usability when you're talking about academic research. If you're looking for general information, using social media, newspapers, magazines, even podcasts are perfectly valid ways of getting information that pertains to your uh, personal life. But doing academic research you require you to have more reliable sources than, let's say, social media. So considering what we talked about last module, you are going to be looking at primary and possibly secondary sources, people who are doing research directly and reporting their results. You are not looking for people who are reiterating well-known facts. 
And one of the ways you can decide where to look for information is to look at three specific areas, intent, audience, and format. When you understand what intent means, that can help you to identify types of sources. So what is the purpose of this information? Are they trying to sell me something? Are they trying to change my mind? Are they explaining a problem? If you're looking at news sources, what is the political bias of that news source? Are they trying to spin facts in order to create an emotional response? If you are looking at a um, medical solution, is the person selling that medical solution? Or are they trying to prevent you from using a different solution? All of those things are really important to understand because what you want to find are sources that are trying to educate you, to provide information, to give context without being overly biased. And you want to combine that with who is the intended audience? Is it supposed to be other professionals, other scientists within that field? Is it general education, maybe for general college classes? Is it the public? This is to inform you about something that happened. Is it intended for students? Who is intended to read this? And combining both intent and audience will really help you understand what format you're looking at. Are you looking for a book? Are you looking for a journal or an article? Sometimes you might be looking for either a website, a social media post, a blog post. If you're doing primary research about, let's say, a very current topic and you are looking for a blog post that the CEO of a company posted in order to confirm that they were aware of a problem that was going on in their company, those kinds of things would be very useful depending on the type of paper you are doing, the type of topic that you are pursuing. You need to look at the entire picture, the format, the intent, and the audience. All aspects of the source work together to give you a full picture of what type of source is going to be beneficial. And it's important to know what type of source you want because it's much easier to search for information if you know what you're looking for. We are going to talk a little bit about a couple of types of sources. Last module, we talked about primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, and these will also connect with that in a slightly different manner. So first, we're going to talk about scholarly sources. What are scholarly sources, and where do they fall within the primary, secondary, and tertiary categories? So the content is primary in a scholarly source. It is in-depth informative, and it is intended to further deep understanding of a topic. There will be author credentials. The author is an expert or an academic. That's very important because knowing who the author is and that the author has the education and experience in order to fully prove that they have a deep understanding of the content they're creating is very important to making an, a source trustworthy. The audience that you're looking at will be other scholars, researchers, and academic students like yourself. It is going to be a peer-reviewed, which means many experts in the field will all be researching and reviewing this before it is ever published in order to make sure the information is as accurate as possible. And a scholarly source is going to provide references. They will let you know how they found this information, where they found it, who agrees with them, who is disagreeing with them, and how this source fits into the context of the topic. The second type of source is a popular source. The content is going to be secondary. It will reference other people's research, and it will have general information about the topic. It might be entertaining or informative. But the author is usually a journalist. They're not an expert in the field, but they are an expert 
in communicating information in a way that makes it accessible to people who aren't in education. The audience is a public audience. General people, it will be easy to understand. It will be accessible for the majority of people. Um, as far as how people are determining whether the information is correct, this will be run past an editor. And that editor is most likely not an expert in the field, but they're probably pretty used to understanding what facts need to have sources. So they might not be checking up on that sources, but they might be ensuring that there just are sources in general in, in this article. Um, references are rarely listed, but if it's an online popular source, they may be included as a hyperlink. The third type of source would be a trade document, and this would be news, updates, industry-specific practical applications concerning a topic. So it may be um, information about a new piece of technology that's specifically going to be implemented within a particular industry. The authority of this is usually a professional within that field, someone who is either part of that business or it's a journalist who has connections to that field. They are usually experts if it's a professional, but they're not academic experts. The audience is gonna be other professionals or perhaps hobbyists who take a great interest within that field. This will also be editor approved, which means that the editor may be a person who works within that industry and you have the potential for bias because this is a business publication and business publications are probably going to be heavily um, influenced by who is publishing them and how they want their company to be perceived. They also rarely list references because the information is produced by the company and then published by the company. They are their own reference. When you are doing academic research, you will want to focus on scholarly sources. They are primary sources, the author is an expert or an academic, and they are peer reviewed. And these are three very important aspects to making sure that you are using credible information. So what exactly are peer reviewed sources and why are they important? So peer reviewed sources are read, evaluated, and rejected or accepted by experts in the field. Published peer-reviewed sources will be reviewed and revised many times before publication to limit any errors, bias, or redundancy. So I've included an image here that shows the whole process of the peer review flowchart. So all the way at the left, the author has already done the research, they have written the document, they are submitting it. And then it goes to staff editors. And if they don't consider this to be a credible source, it doesn't go any farther along in the process. But if they believe the information is interesting and will contribute to the conversation around this topic, they will move it back to the author with their own revisions. And it will have to be revised by the author before the editors will look at it a second time. Now, after the author has revised the editor with all of the cor corrections, then it will be moved to peer reviewers who will read and provide comments on the manuscript. And there are more than one peer reviewers, usually about three to four who will read this paper independently and um, provide revisions for the author. And this cycle will continue until they are satisfied with the quality of the paper. And then it will return back to the staff editors who will consult with other academic topic specific editors and come to a decision at that point about whether they even are prepared to publish this paper. If they do decide to proceed with that 
publication, the author is going to go to a post peer review history. Then it will go to the publication office and it will finally be um, available uh, to the public. This is a long process and it will take months of time and months of work for the author to fully satisfy these peer reviewers that their information is correct and as limited with bias and errors as possible. Well, how can you tell if the article you found is actually a peer-reviewed article? I am showing you an example of an article on the right that includes its table of contents. And there are some very specific sections of this article that can help you identify it as a peer-reviewed article. On the left, this list, things to look for include an abstract, having an introduction section, including a methods, methodology, and research section, having a section dedicated specifically to results, and then having a discussion and a conclusion that talks about what those results mean. A bonus hint is if there's a lot of charts, graphs, and tables of data that this article or this author created. And it's possible you may also find a section about funding, and that may help you determine what kind of bias goes into this article. On the right, this example, we do have a methodology section, we have a results section, we have both a discussion and a conclusion. Those are all very good indications that this is a primary peer-reviewed article. So what information and sources do you need for your assignment? And the first thing to do is understand your assignment. Talk to your professor. Read the syllabus. Check Canvas. Because depending on your assignment, you will need different types of sources. And that will help you know what you're looking for. And you can use that information to decide whether you want to change your topic or if you want to continue on with that subject that you're looking at. 